This is the Investor Connect podcast program. I'm Hall T. Martin. I'm the host of the show in which we interview angel investors, venture capital, family offices, private equity, and many other investors for early stage and growth companies. I hope you enjoy this episode. Investor Connect is a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to the education of investors and startups for fundraising. Please consider donating $100 to the program to help others in their investor and entrepreneur journey. You can find the donate button on the InvestorConnect.org website. Well, hello, this is Hall Martin with Investor Connect. Today, I'm here with Christian Napier, founder and CEO of Reconto. Reconto helps build bonds by enabling people to connect through stories recorded on video and automatically transcribed and shared on the platform. Christian, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Hall. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Great. So where are you calling from today? I'm calling from snowy Salt Lake City. It's been snowing quite a bit. We've got about eight inches on the ground so far. Great. Well, tell us more about your background and what you did before this. Well, I've been in the knowledge and learning space and technology for almost 30 years, for more than two decades of that, working within the Olympic movement, uh, starting with the Salt Lake 2002 Olympic and Paralympic Winter Games, and have spent the last 17, 16 years, I guess, 16, almost 17 years, focused on the knowledge management area of major sport events, the last seven of those as the International Olympic Committee's Knowledge Management Advisor. Great. Well, tell us more about starting a business in the area of enterprise knowledge management. What is that like? Well, it's an interesting journey. Let me expand on what I was just talking about a moment ago, working with the Olympic Games. So in the Olympic Games, institutional knowledge loss is a given because each Games is hosted in a different city, which is organized by a different local organizing committee. And so starting in the year 2000, after the Sydney Games, the International Olympic Committee created what was called at that time Olympic Games Knowledge Services to help formalize the transfer of knowledge from one host city to another. And they've done a fantastic job of managing knowledge in an Olympic environment where you have this institutional knowledge loss baked in. But one thing that was missing and one reason that I was brought on as an advisor to the IOC was the loss of contextual knowledge or tacit knowledge. It's the knowledge that's up here. Because tens of thousands of documents and CAD drawings and spreadsheets and everything are are handed over from one city to another. And they've also got observation programs and workshops and things like this. But they didn't really have an effective way to, to convey this knowledge that existed in people's heads to future organizers. It just, it just really wasn't possible unless you were lucky enough to be there in person and attend an event in person and meet the person. So starting with the Rio 2016 Games, the International Olympic Committee started this program called Structured Interviews. And through that program, we've interviewed well over a thousand people on five different continents about their engagement with the Olympic Games and how they've gone about planning and operating the most complex sport event on the planet. And going through that process, I realized other organizations besides the International Olympic Committee could benefit from doing this, but there were some technological hurdles that needed to be overcome to make it more cost-effective and efficient to share, to request, to record, to receive, to transcribe, to curate and to share this tacit or contextual knowledge. Right. So what is the opportunity here? How big is this market and how many groups are in it? Well, the market for knowledge really spans every organization on the planet. We all suffer from this. I just was reading today uh, here in Utah, the fourth tech unicorn laid off 20% of its workforce. And when that workforce is gone, all of the knowledge that's in their head is gone with them. We saw recently with Elon Musk uh, taking over Twitter, you know, very dynamic uh, takeover. And, you know, it's created a lot of conversation about how to change a culture. And I'm not here to pass any judgment on Elon, but I remember 
very interestingly, following a Twitter conversation that he was having with one of his software developers about the reason for the the application's uh, poor performance outside of the United States. And within 24 hours, this developer was gone. He He was locked out of his accounts. And I thought to myself, you know, not only was this gentleman locked out of his company accounts, but now the company Twitter was locked out of him. They didn't have access to the six plus years of decisions, why things were done, because that was up in this guy's head. And so with this tumultuous environment uh, that we have now with the great resignation, coupled with all of these layoffs that are going on, there's a lot of uncertainty in the labor market that's become more incumbent and more important than ever to have vehicles to compensate for this institutional knowledge loss. In terms of our our organization, our low-hanging fruit are, is the sport market major events because we have a lot of network there. But beyond that, there are a lot of organizations, particularly those who are looking at generational institutional knowledge loss because the workforce is aging and retiring. We're seeing this in manufacturing. We're seeing this in construction. There are other areas where a lot of those workers are baby boomers and they're nearing that retirement age. And, and so those are those are really, really good clients for us. Great. And so what's the challenge in starting a business here? What do you have to overcome to make it work? That's a great question, Hall. All of us that are are entrepreneurs and founders would say capital is a challenge, of course, because it takes money and it takes an investment in order to solve some of these problems for the market. I will say from a SaaS perspective, solution perspective, which we are, we are enterprise SaaS, finding the right development team can be a challenge. There are a lot of questions about, well, who do you bring on to develop and and where should they be? Uh, should they be close to you? Should you be able to meet with them physically on a day-to-day basis? If you're working with developers overseas, uh, what are the challenges associated with that? We were very fortunate to find a fantastic team of developers out of Brazil from relationships that I had working on the Olympic Games. And they've been absolutely amazing. But common to everybody else, it's finding product market fit, having the capital to go through that discovery, and then the capital to exploit it. Uh, you know, those are the challenges, I think, uh, and starting business. And in this climate, it's it's more difficult to raise capital, I think, than it was maybe 12 to 18 months ago when the country was more flush with cash, speaking speaking here in the United States. Great. Well, so what is the potential reward of this kind of solution? How, how profitable do you think it might be? And what kind of businesses do we think we can create from it? Well, I'll answer that question in two parts, Hall. The first part is the value added to the customers, to the clients who use this. You know, what they see is a process that is at least 30 times faster than it is getting content or knowledge through writing. It is so much easier to do it through talking than it is through writing. And our solution is tailor-made for that. It's made to allow people to share their knowledge verbally through video in a very, very natural way and to do it in a method that in a platform that would allow them to save 75% or more over traditional methods. So there's a tremendous uh, value add, not just in helping organizations retain that knowledge, but help them do it quickly and help it do it in a cost-effective way, which is really, really important in these inflationary times. And how does that translate to the investors? Well, because we're solving a substantial problem in the market, then the potential reward for investors, I think, is really significant. So we've seen in this, you know, the forecasts in the space are, are for several hundred billion dollars in spend and knowledge management, which is going to increase substantially over the next three to four years. And we'll see that trend continue, I think, as we see the acceleration of boomers leaving the workforce. ADECO has forecasted that 70 million boomers here in the U.S. will leave the workforce by 2030. And that may happen even more quickly, seeing how the current environment is going along. And so organizations need to be prepared for that, take advantage of that. So we're in a good position to really help these companies and, by extension, help the investors 
who joined us on the journey. Right. And so what are the differences between you and your competitors? How are you unique and different? Well, that's a great question again, Hall. Our competitors are mostly not in the knowledge management space, but this process of asynchronous recording and delivery of of content is more prevalent in the marketing space. So you'll see companies that are focused on using this kind of a transaction tool, this kind of technology for video social proof. So it's more of a marketing bent as opposed to a knowledge bent. We certainly do that as well. But our bread and butter really is made in the knowledge space. As I mentioned at the outset, I've been involved in this for almost 30 years. So so I know this space intimately and I understand the needs of the clients in this space and I know how we can solve them. So I think this really gives us a leg up over, over our competitors. And in addition to that, I have learned through sad experience over these 30 years that oftentimes the business models that are employed by technology solutions actually adversely impact the incentive to share knowledge. Why? Because their licensing models restrict companies' abilities to share knowledge because sharing knowledge is more expensive. We have very consciously put in place a model that allows enterprises to share knowledge literally without limits. So it doesn't matter how many employees you have or how many stories they need to share. We will work with you to define one set price so that you are not penalized. Your organization is not penalized when you want to share knowledge with more people or you want to gather knowledge or harvest knowledge from more people. So we reject the per seat licensing that is prevalent in the industry in this space, we've created a a pricing structure that is friendly to companies sharing knowledge. It's been a pet peeve of mine for decades that companies really want to be able to harvest and share knowledge, but they're penalized financially for doing so, which causes them to restrict this true knowledge sharing to just a few people in the organization. And we have, I think, overcome that challenge in our business model. And I think that makes us really competitive in the space. Great. So what advice would you give to someone entering this space? What do you tell them that they may not know about it? It's not as easy as you think it is. (laughs) (laughs) I I remember because I've been working on this project with the International Olympic Committee for seven years, I understand intimately the process of harvesting contextual knowledge, I thought, oh, well, getting developers to build a tool that will allow us to do this more effectively, it should be pretty simple because I already understand how this needs to function. That was a mistake. (laughs) It took a lot longer. And it wasn't because, well, I had a hard time communicating with the with the developers my the, the real needs of the market. The fact of the matter is, I didn't know everything. I thought I knew more than I did. And I needed more time to listen to clients, to listen to what their problems really were, to find more effective solutions. And so my advice, I guess, for someone that is going to be entering this space would be to humble yourself and talk to a lot of people. You know, (laughs) really get a good sense of what the market is really looking for, uh, not make assumptions based on your own experience that, well, since these guys need it, well, then everybody needs it. And it needs to be like this because other people have other needs and they'll tell you what the better way is. But you've just got to take the time and, and reach out and listen to them. Great. And so what online information source do you find most helpful in your work? Well, I mean, all of us now rely heavily on Uncle Google, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and we have a question. That's where we go to answer. In the spirit of eating our own dog food, uh, to, so to speak, video has been so prevalent. We throw around this title of YouTube University, right? So there are videos for every subject imaginable available to people on YouTube. It actually is it's incredibly fascinating. Now, this source 
I don't know if it's strictly online, but I, I'll just make a plug for you, Hall. You know, working with 10 Capital has been really, really helpful for us because although we have a pretty good sense of our space, this environment of, of raising capital is relatively new to us. And so having you and your team there to really help us navigate uh, through the space has been has been really, really helpful, both on online solutions, but also spending time offline or spending on, you know, time uh, having conversations. So most grateful for, to you and your team for that. Great. Appreciate that. And so my next question is, what is one thing your business did that you didn't expect? You said it's a harder space than it looks, but what did you find? Pivot. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think pivots are necessarily expected, or maybe they are, but you don't know what the pivot's supposed to be ahead of time. The market is reacting, and then you like have to make decisions. Oh, okay, well, well, what am I going to do with this reaction in the market? And more often than not, it's pivot. It took us a little time to find our footing. I originally started this company because I wanted a place to actually capture and share my family's stories. I wanted a place for for my mother's story to reside permanently, to be shared in a way that I really felt honored her memory and honored the memory of uh, family members and friends. So deep down inside, I really believe that everybody's important and their stories matter. But as we started that originally, we realized pretty quickly that there were much more substantial, from a financial standpoint, opportunities in the B2B space as opposed to the B2C space. And so we had to make pivot, you know, from that B2C focus to B2B. That B2C is still important to me personally. It tugs at my heartstrings, you know, the ability to be able to share my mother's story and my my uncle's story. And just on Friday, we had a funeral in the family. My my wife's uncle came to us and said, would you please help me capture my story? This is very, very important to me. But from a business standpoint, having invested, you know, $200,000 of my own money uh, starting up this business, I realized, you know, for this to be commercially viable, I have to, I have to offer a solution that is going to, you know, pay the bills. And I, and I realized after talking with a lot of people in the market that, that the, the, the enterprise knowledge management focus was really, really, uh, had a lot of potential for us. And so I didn't expect that pivot going in, but it was a welcome pivot. And it actually pivoted me back to where I started in the knowledge management arena within major events. Great. Well, in the last minutes that we have here, what else should we cover that we haven't? Wow. I would just emphasize the importance of capturing and harvesting contextual knowledge. I remember working with the IOC, having a conversation after or leading up to the Rio games. And at that time, the conversation was, well, we don't have any way of sharing this content. We don't have a platform that will host it. So should we delay these interviews until the next game's edition because we're just not ready? And my emphatic response to that was, no, harvest the knowledge now. Figure out how to use it later. <laughs> Don't worry about the technologies. You know, and whether it's through us or some other company, I would encourage every listener in every organization to figure out a way to harvest this knowledge fast because you never know when it's going to leave. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking with an organization, a gentleman who works for an organization a couple of weeks ago. They've lost 50% of their engineers. They're a manufacturing company. They've lost 50% of their engineers this year due to attrition. Other companies are coming around poaching these guys. They're leaving for greener pastures and they're taking a tremendous amount of knowledge with them. At the beginning of this year, nobody in that company could have foreseen that they were going to lose 50% of their engineers this year. But it happened. And they had no plan in place to harvest that knowledge before those guys left. And so... You know, that would be my message to all of your listeners is take advantage of the technologies that we have now, even if it's just having people pull out their phones and record something to start harvesting this contextual or this tacit knowledge from your employees and minimize the damage that can be caused 
by large scale institutional knowledge loss. Well, that's great. So, so how best for listeners to get back in touch with you? Easiest to reach me on LinkedIn. So just look up Christian Napier on LinkedIn. You'll find me there. And I'm happy to connect with uh, any of your listeners and, and have a conversation. Great. We'll include that in the show notes. I want to thank you for joining us today and hope to have you back for a follow-up soon. All right, Paul. Thank you so much for the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity. Investor Connect helps investors interested in startup funding. In this podcast series, experienced investors share their experience and advice. You can learn more at InvestorConnect.org. Paul T. Martin is the director of Investor Connect, which is a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to the education of investors for early stage funding. All opinions expressed by Hall and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Investor Connect. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions.